Hello and welcome to this first chapter in this DP600 exam preparation course. We're going to be looking at how to plan a data analytics environment in Fabric. Now this is the first chapter in 11 chapters that we're going to be going through, teaching you everything you need to know to hopefully pass the DP600 exam. In this chapter, we're going to be covering exactly what you need to know. If you look at the study guide in Microsoft Learn, these are the elements that we're going to be covering. How do we identify requirements for a solution? So the various components, features, performance, capacity, SKUs, that kind of thing. How do we make decisions about that? We're also going to be looking at how to recommend settings in the Fabric admin portal. How do we choose data gateway types? And also creating custom Power BI report theme. Towards the end of the lesson, we'll be testing your knowledge with five sample questions. And just as a reminder, all of the lesson notes and key points and link to further learning resources, they're going to be published on the school community. So if you're not already a member, I'll leave a link in the description. Now you will play the main character in a scenario. And this scenario is going to walk you through everything you need to know for those four elements of the study guide. Are you ready? Let's begin. So you are a consultant and you're starting your first day on a new project. And this is Camilla. She is your client for the project. And on the phone before the meeting, Camilla had mentioned that she wants to implement Fabric, but she doesn't know really where to start. And that's where you come in. You're going to start with a requirements gathering workshop. So you organize a full day workshop with Camilla, the client, to truly understand their business and their requirements. Now your goals for this workshop are to extract a set of requirements from the client to help you build a plan for their new fabric environment. And another goal is to do such a great job in planning their environment that the client is going to give you a new contract by the end of it to build the thing. Okay. So this requirements gathering workshop, what are you going to ask Camilla? What do you need to know when you're identifying the requirements? You should think about focusing on these three elements to begin with. The capacities. So how many do we need? What sizing do the capacities need to be in this new environment? Then we're going to look at data ingestion methods. So there's lots of different ways that we can ingest data into Fabric. You're going to ask a set of questions that's going to kind of deduce the best method for getting data into Fabric based on the requirements. Similarly, we've got data storage. So we've got three different options for storing data in Fabric. How do you ask the right questions and identify the requirements to choose the right one? So let's start off thinking about capacity requirements. Now, the requirements that we need here are really the number of capacities that are required and the sizing. So the SKU, the stock keeping units, you probably know by now that in Fabric, we have capacities of varying sizes. So what determines the number of capacities required? So from previous videos, you've probably understood that one of the things that impacts the number of capacities required is compliance with data residency regulations. So the capacity dictates where your data is stored. So if you have regulations that dictate that your data must reside in the EU, for example, for GDPR, that's going to be one capacity in your business. If you have other requirements that say these data sets need to be stored in the US, you're going to have to have a separate capacity for that as well. Another thing that can impact the number of capacities is the billing preference. So the capacity is how you get billed in Fabric. So some organizations might want to separate the billing between different departments in their organization. So they might have one capacity for the finance department, one capacity for your consulting division, one capacity for your marketing department, for example. Another thing that could determine the number of capacities that you need is segregating by workload type. So if you have a lot of heavy, intensive data engineering workloads, then you might want to put those in a separate capacity and give it enough resource to allow you to do that in a confined capacity. Then your serving of business intelligence, you might want to do that in a separate capacity so that the read performance on those kind of dashboards is not impacted by the heavy data engineering stuff, and maybe machine learning stuff that's being done in other capacities. You might also want to segregate by department just through business preference as well, aligned with that billing preference. So some companies like to have their capacity aligned to various departments within their business. So these are the things you need to extract in terms of requirements when you're talking with this client. And what about the sizing? Well, we've touched on that already, but some of the things that impact the sizing of a capacity are the intensity of the expected workloads. So are you going to be doing high volumes of data ingestion? Are you going to be getting gigabytes of fresh data into Fabric or even terabytes of data into Fabric every day? These are going to use a lot of your resources and to go through them quickly, 
it helps if you have a higher capacity. Similarly, heavy data transformation. So if you're doing a lot of heavy transformations in Spark, that's going to use a lot of resources. So if that's something you're going to be doing regularly in your business, you want to be choosing a high capacity for that. Again, machine learning training can be very resource intensive. It's going to take hours or sometimes even days to train a machine learning model. If that's something you're going to be doing regularly, you want to be having that on a high capacity. The budget of your client also dictates the capacity, the sizing of the capacity that you're going to choose. Obviously, the more resources, the higher that SKU that you decide, the more expensive it's going to be. And some clients might be very sensitive around the cost. And related to that is, can you afford to wait? Or can the client afford to wait? Because if you procure a F2 SKU, it's probably going to go through your data, but it might take a very long time. And in some business, that might not be a problem. Maybe you're just doing data ingestion once per day. You ingest all of your fresh data and it might take a lot longer on an F2 capacity, but that's not necessarily a problem. Maybe you can do it overnight. And by the time people come in in the morning, all of that data has been ingested or transformed and it's ready for consumption in the morning. So what's your propensity to wait? Now, some other companies might have regular data coming in every hour, like gigabytes of data every hour. And in that scenario, you really need a high capacity to be able to churn through all of that stuff and get it processed before the next hourly load, for example. Another thing that can determine the sizing of the capacity is, does the client want access to F64 features? So there's quite a lot actually of features that open up when you get to F64. So Copilot being a good example currently. And there's many, many more. I'll list them on the screen here. These are features that only really are available if you choose F64 capacity or above. So that's something to bear in mind. If you want to use any of these features, you need an F64 plus. So what about the data ingestion requirements? Well, here, what we really need to know is what are the fabric items and or features that you need to get data into Fabric? And how are you going to configure these items once you've built them? Now, some of the options here, and this is not an exhaustive list, there's lots of different options here. We've got the shortcut, database mirroring, ETL via data flow, ETL via data pipeline and a notebook, and the event stream. So these are some of the options that you might want to consider. So what are the questions that you need to ask of a client when you're identifying the requirements to help you make the decision here? Well, these are some of the deciding factors. The main one really is where is the external data stored? If it's in ADLS Gen 2, Amazon S3, or an S3 compatible storage location like Cloudflare, for example, Google Cloud Storage or the Dataverse, well then these are the ones that are gonna be available for you to shortcut into Fabric. So if you get any questions in the exam around, you know, my data is stored in ADLS Gen 2, well, obviously the shortcut is a good option for that. Now, it's not necessarily the only option. You can still do ETL via any of these storage locations, but it does open up that shortcut possibility. Now, if you see Azure SQL, Azure Cosmos DB or Snowflake mentioned, then immediately you should start thinking, OK, this could be database mirrored. So you can use database mirroring to create that kind of live link to the database and it's going to maintain a mirror inside of Fabric. Is it on premises? Now, if your data is stored on premises, then you're going to be probably want to be using the ETL via data flows or data pipelines because these two activities, these two items allow you to create that on-premise data gateway on your on-premise server and then connect to that via the data flow or the data pipeline. And if you've got real-time events, real-time streaming data, obviously you probably want to using the event stream to get that data into Fabric. Anything else, really you're going to be looking at ETL by either the data flow, the data pipeline, and the notebook. And when to choose which one, well, I've done a very long video. I'll leave a link in the description, or you can click here to make that decision about which of these is best for that particular organization. So related to that is also what skills exist in the team, because you don't want to build a solution that can't be maintained and managed by the company or your company or your client's company. So if you're looking for a predominantly no and low code experience, then you're going to want to be focusing on the ETL via data flows and data pipelines. Both of these are fairly low and no code experiences to help you get data into Fabric. If you've got a lot of SQL experience in your team, then here you can be using the data pipeline. You can use the script activities to do uh, transformations on your data as it's coming in. And if you have people that are familiar with Spark, Python, Scala, that kind of thing, then you can use the ETL notebook. If you're, you know, perhaps you've got data coming from a REST API and you want to be using Python libraries to get that in, 
that's a good option for you there. So whilst we're on the topic of data ingestion, there's a few other features that you need to be aware of that might come up in the exam that can help you identify different requirements for getting data into Fabric. These are the on-premise data gateway, which we mentioned, the VNet, the virtual network data gateway, fast copy and staging. So you might be asked some questions about these things in the exam as well. So when do we decide on these sorts of things? Well, you need to ask how the data in the external system is being secured, right? So if it's on-premise, if it's an on-premise SQL server, you have to be using the on-premise data gateway. If your data is living in Azure behind some sort of virtual network or private endpoint, that kind of thing, then you want to be setting up the VNet data gateway to access that. And in terms of the volume of data, this is also going to have an impact on the items that you choose for doing your data ingestion and also some of the features available. So if you've got low or medium data per day, well, if it's low, then you probably don't need any of these specific features, like the out of the box solutions will be good enough. But if you've got quite a lot of data, kind of gigabytes per day in that kind of range, you want to be using some of the features like fast copy, and staging. Similarly, if you've got very high amounts of data, these are going to be one of using the fast copy and the staging. But if you're using data flows, alternatively, you can use data pipelines. And if you can get data in via a fabric notebook, then that's another option as well. So before we move on, I just want to mention a bit more detail around the data gateways. Now, as you probably know already, there are two types of data gateways that we can configure in Microsoft Fabric. Number one is the on-premise data gateway. And number two is the virtual network data gateway. And a data gateway, in essence, helps us access data that's otherwise secured. So if this data is on an on-premise SQL server, for example, it gives us a secure way to access that data and bring it into Fabric. Likewise, if you've got data behind a virtual network secured in Azure, in like blob storage or ADLS Gen 2, it provides us with a secure mechanism to access that data. So I'm not going to show you step by step how to set up a data gateway in this lesson. But what I have done is linked to two other videos by other creators that show the process in detail. If you want to go and have a look, I'll leave that in the school community. But I do want to just cover kind of the high level process for each of them, just so you understand a bit more about what that looks like if you've never set one up before. So for the on-premise data gateway, there's a few high level steps. Number one, we need to install the data gateway on the on-premise server. And if you've already got an on-premise data gateway set up on your on-premise server, perhaps you're using it in traditional Power BI data flows, for example, then you're going to need to update it to the latest version because that's going to be compatible with Microsoft Fabric. The next step is to, in Fabric, create a new on-premise data gateway connection. And then from that, you can connect to that data gateway from either a data flow and now also a data pipeline. So the data pipeline was recently added in the last few weeks. I think it's still in preview that connection. So you might not get asked about it in the exam, but it's good to know that now it's actually possible via the data flow and the data pipeline. To set up the VNet data gateway, we're going to start in Azure. There's a few settings that you need to configure in your Azure environment before you can set up the VNet data gateway connection. So you're going to need to register a Power Platform resource provider within your Azure subscription. And then within the item that you want to share or you want to access, for example, in your Azure blob storage item in Azure, you need to create a private endpoint in the networking settings, and then create a subnet. And then we're going to use that in Fabric to create a new virtual network data gateway connection. And then again, from that, you can connect to it via your data flow to be able to access that data that is behind that virtual network in Azure. So next, let's look at the data storage requirements. And when we're talking to our client here, identifying requirements, really what we're trying to extract is, okay, what fabric data stores are going to be best for these requirements? And what overall architectural pattern are we going to be aiming for with this solution? Now, the options here are obviously the lake house, the data warehouse, and the KQL database. And some of the deciding factors to choose between these are, well, what's the data type? Okay, so is it structured or semi-structured or even unstructured? So are you going to be getting raw files, CSV, JSON, maybe from a REST API? Is it unstructured? Is it image data, video? Is it audio data, for example? These are all going to be wanted to store in the lake house because this is kind of the only place in Fabric where you can store a variety of different file formats. If your data is relational, 
and structured, then obviously you can keep that in either the lake house or the data warehouse. And if it's real time and streaming, you're gonna be one of streaming that into your KQL database. Next up, another important consideration when choosing a data store is what skills exist in the team. So if you're predominantly T SQL based, then you're gonna want to be using the data warehouse experience. If you're predominantly Spark, and Python, Scala, that kind of thing, then you're gonna be wanting to storing your data predominantly in the lake house. And if you're predominantly using KQL in your organization, that's gonna be wanting to using KQL database for your data storage. Congratulations, you've completed your first engagement for Camilla. You've convinced her to set up a proof of concept project in her organization. So she's already created the Fabric Free Trial she set up her environment, but immediately she's hit a bit of a hurdle. So this is your next mission. She rings you up and she says, hey, I need some help. I opened the Fabric admin portal and nearly had a heart attack. Please, can you help me understand all of these settings? So you set up a call with Camilla to help her understand the Fabric admin portal. How are you going to teach her and what are you gonna teach her about the admin portal? What are the most important settings that she needs to know about? Okay, just before we get into the Fabric admin portal and look at some of the settings available to us in there, it's important to note that to be able to access the admin portal, of course, first you need a Fabric license, but then you need to have one of the following roles. You need to be either a global administrator, a power platform administrator, or a Fabric administrator. So within the admin portal here in Fabric, you'll see this menu on the left-hand side. So these are some of the important settings in tenant settings. Here you can allow users to create Fabric items. So if you just set up Fabric in your organization, you need to allow people to actually create Fabric items. Without that, you can't really get very far. Enable preview features. So every time Microsoft release new features, normally they put them in the admin portal and you can allow or disallow users in your organization to use them. You can also allow users to create workspaces. There's a whole host of security related features that you can manage and get control over in your tenant. So for example, how do you manage guest users? Allowing single sign-on options for things like Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift accounts, that kind of thing. How do you block public internet access? So that's really important to know. Enabling other features like Azure Private Link, for example, allowing the service principal access to the Fabric APIs. So if you're gonna be doing some automation, you need to allow access to service principles to the API. There's also options in there for allowing Git integration. So if you're setting up version control, that needs to be enabled there. And there's also some features like allowing Copilot within the organization as well. Now, in general, some of the settings can be one of three things. It could be enabled for the entire organization. It can be enabled for specific security groups. So say you only want super users to be able to use this feature or admins within your Fabric environment to use a specific feature, then you can enable it for specific security groups, or you can enable it for all except certain security groups. So everyone in your organization gets access apart from these people, perhaps guest users is a good example. Now, other settings in Fabric tenant settings are kind of binary. You either enable them or you disable them for the entire organization. Another important point in the Fabric admin portal are the capacity settings. So this section here, and in here, you can create new capacities, delete capacities, manage the capacity commission, and also change the size of a capacity. So these are some important capacity settings that you need to be aware of understand how they work and how to manage them within your Fabric environment. So great, you've taught Camilla about the Fabric admin portal and she's very grateful. But before the meeting ends, she has one more thing she wants to ask you about. She says, one final thing before you go, and it might seem a bit random, but when we migrate to Fabric, I want our BI team to create more consistent reports. Have you got any ideas about how we can achieve that? And of course, the first thing you think of are custom Power BI report themes. Now, there are many ways to create a custom report theme in Power BI. You can either update the current theme if you're in Power BI desktop, or you can write a kind of JSON template yourself using the documentation. If you're feeling a bit brave, you can do that yourself. Or you can also use a third party online tool. There's quite a few report theme generator tools that exist online, but it's unlikely you're gonna be tested on that in the exam. So your task is to show Camilla how to create a custom report theme. So let's have a look at how you can do that within Power BI Desktop. 
So here I've got a report and what I'm going to do to access the report themes, you need to go to the view tab. Then you can see these themes here. And obviously these are the preset themes. So you can just click and update the current theme very simply like that. But to do most of the customization, you need to click on this button here and you're going to access the current theme and all accessible themes that are currently installed on this machine. And then there's a few settings down here that are quite important to know. So browse for themes. If you click on that, it's gonna allow you to import a Power BI report theme. So if you've already got a theme here, for example, this one here, then you can select that and install it into your environment like so. If you want to customize the current theme, you can do that like this. And it's gonna bring you through to this UI environment just to you know, change some colors, change some text, change some visuals. What you have to think about for this section of the exam is what could they ask you? You have to think about how could you possibly be tested on this? So in terms of the Power BI report theme stuff, you're likely to be tested on these buttons here and what they do. Plus they could ask you about a JSON theme. So they could show you a JSON theme and maybe ask you about, okay, how can you edit this theme? What doesn't look right in this theme? That kind of thing. So it's good to have a bit of familiarity about the different sections in these JSON files. So the name of it, how you can store your data colors as a list, some of these different settings here. You're probably not expected to memorize all of the different settings in JSON format, but you might get shown a theme in JSON format and asked to modify it or asked to comment on it in some way. To export the current theme, you can also use this save current theme, and that's gonna allow you to export a JSON file that you can share within your organization. And you've also got here access to the theme gallery. So this is gonna bring you through to the theme gallery website where you can download other people people's themes for your report. To finish up this video and this lesson, we're going to go through five practice questions just to kind of solidify that knowledge, make sure you're understanding some of the key concepts within a context of a scenario. So the first question is, you're running an F2 capacity and you regularly experience throttling with that capacity. Now there's a number of long running spark jobs that take on average three hours to complete and you need these to complete in under one hour. So you plan to increase the SKU of the capacity. Where would you go to make this change? Would you go to the workspace settings and configure Spark settings? Would you go to the admin portal and the capacity settings section and then click through to Azure to update your capacity? Would you go to the monitoring hub and look at the run history? Or would you use the capacity metrics app? So pause the video here and have a bit of a think and then I'll move on. So the answer is to B. So you can manage your capacity settings within admin portal and then capacity settings. And then you can actually click through to Azure. It gives you a link to the Azure portal. And that's where you're gonna change the capacity within the Azure portal. Obviously you can't be within the Spark settings. That's for managing the configuration of your Spark cluster within a workspace. And in the monitoring hub, we can't get anything there to do with capacity settings. That's just gonna tell you how your jobs are running. And in the capacity metrics app, that's just a read only app for having a look at how your capacity is being used. So that wouldn't also be suitable either. Question number two, your data governance team would like to certify a semantic model to make it discoverable in your organization. Now only the data governance team should be able to do this. In what order should you complete the following tasks to certify a semantic model? So have a look at the five actions here. And what you're gonna to have to do is put these in an order. So these are, this is an ordered list, it should be. So one of the things you'll have to do first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. So once you've got these in order, we'll move on. So let's look at the answer now. So the correct order looks a bit like this. So we start by creating a security group for the data governance team. The clue in the question was that only the data governance team should be able to do this. So when you see that, you think, okay, well, they need to be within a security group to enable this. Number two, and you could argue that one and two could be interchangeable, but these are the first two items anyway, but enable the make certified content discoverable. So within the admin portal, the tenant settings, there's a section for discovery. You're gonna to need to enable that for the organization. And then after that, you're gonna to have to make sure that that settings is applied only to the data governance security group that you set up. Then you're gonna to need to ask the data governance team to go into the semantic model settings and then endorsement and discovery and click certify for that semantic model. And then you want to validate that that has been set up correctly and your business user can see that certified semantic model within the OneLake Data Hub. Three, 
You join a new company and you're given a Power BI report theme as a JSON file to use for all new projects. How do you apply this JSON file theme to the report that you're currently developing? Is it A, in Power BI Desktop, go to View, Themes, and Customize Current Theme. B, go to the Fabric Admin Portal, click on Custom Branding, and then set the default report theme. C, use Tabular Editor 2 to update the theme. Or D, in Power BI Desktop, go to the View, themes and then browse for themes. So the answer here is D, in Power BI Desktop, go to the view, themes, and then browse for themes. So D and A are quite similar, but A is for customizing a current theme. So that's not gonna be allowing you to import a JSON file. That's gonna allow you to use the user interface to update the current theme. So that's not what we want to do. We want to import a JSON file as our report theme, which is possible using D. B, that functionality doesn't actually exist. Custom branding does exist, but that allows you just to update the colors and the icons within Fabric, not a default report theme. And Tabular Editor 2 is also the incorrect answer. Question four, you have 1000 JSON files stored in Azure Data Lake Storage, ADLS Gen 2, that you want to bring into Fabric. The ADLS Gen 2 storage account is secured using a virtual network. Which of these actions would you need to perform first? Is it A, in Fabric, go to Manage Connections and Gateways, and then click on Create a New Virtual Network Data Gateway. B, create a shortcut to the ADLS Gen 2 storage account. C, in Azure, register a new resource provider and create a private endpoint and subnet. Or D, install an on-premise data gateway on an Azure virtual machine in the same virtual network. Or E, enable public access in the storage account network settings. So for this one, you'll remember that the answer is C. So the first step in setting up a virtual network data gateway is, well, we need to go into Azure. We need to perform some network configuration. Okay, so you need to register that new resource provider, that Microsoft Power Platform resource provider within your subscription. And then on the item, create a private endpoint and a subnet. All of the other options, some of them are steps in the process, but not the first step. So the question was, which of these actions would you need to perform first? So yes, we do need to do A, but it's not gonna be the first thing that you're gonna do. B is kind of a bit of a, a red herring here because you might have seen ADLS Gen 2 and thought, ah, oh, shortcut, but actually you need to configure the virtual network data gateway before you can even think about kind of connecting to it. D, installing the on-premise data gateway. Well, you we know that we're looking at a virtual network here. So you're gonna be choosing the virtual network data gateway rather than an on-premise data gateway. And E, enable public access in the storage account network settings. Well, that's gonna expose your data to the public internet. So not advisable. Question five, you have data stored in tables in Snowflake. Which of the following cannot be used to bring the data into Fabric? A use the data pipeline copy data activity. B, create a shortcut to the Snowflake tables from your lake house. C, use the data flow gen two with the Snowflake connector. D, use database mirroring to create a mirrored Snowflake database in Fabric. So the answer here is B, to create a shortcut to the Snowflake tables from your lake house. As you'll know, you can only shortcut to ADLS gen two or Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage. So the ability to shortcut is generally on files. When we're talking about tables in databases, well, there's all of the other three we can use. So you can do a copy data activity from a data pipeline to bring that data in. If you wanna copy it in, or you can use a Dataflow Gen 2, or you can use database mirroring because Snowflake is one of the databases where database mirroring is possible. Camilla says, thanks. She's seriously impressed with your knowledge. Well done. In this lesson, we've looked at how you can identify requirements for a Fabric solution. We've looked at the different types of data gateways that are available to us in Fabric. We've looked at the settings in the admin portal, and we've also looked at how to create custom Power BI report themes. And the good news is you've won an extension to the contract. Camilla would like you to implement and manage her data analytics environment. So you've got the next stage of the contract. In the next lesson, we'll look at how you can do that how you can set up access control, sensitivity labeling, workspaces, capacities, all that kind of stuff. How do we set these things up inside Fabric? So make sure you click here for the next lesson.